Good evening. I'm Jill Pfeiffer and president of the AMS, and so it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Gibbs Lecture. The AMS Council established the Josiah Willard Gibbs Lectureship in 1923 to make the public aware of the contributions of mathematics to society. Our speaker tonight is Nancy Reed. She's a professor of statistical sciences at the University of Toronto, a Canada Research Chair, and director of the Canadian Statistical Sciences Institute. She received her PhD in 1979 from Stanford and an honorary doctoral degree from the University of Waterloo in 2015. Her main area of research is theoretical statistics. She's had a focus on the accuracy and effectiveness of inferential statements, particularly in connection with understanding complex data sets, and we'll hear more about that this evening. Nancy Reed has received more awards and honors than I have time to tell you about tonight, but I must mention a few. She is an appointed officer of the Order of Canada, founded in 1967 to honor people who have made an extraordinary contribution to the nation of Canada. She was cited for her leadership in the field of statistical inference, helping to facilitate sound policy decision making. She's also an elected member, or rather a foreign associate, of the National U.S. National Academy of Sciences, fellow of several other societies, including Royal Societies of Canada, of Edinburgh, of London. As well as this lecture, Professor Reed has given many named and distinguished lectures around the world, including being an invited speaker at the 8th International Congress on Industrial and Applied Mathematics at Beijing. In addition to accolades for her research, Nancy Reed has been recognized for generous contributions to the profession over several decades, for service to her department, to professional societies, and to national agencies, and for her mentorship and teaching at the undergraduate, graduate level, and early career researchers. This evening, we have the pleasure of hearing her thoughts on the interplay between statistical and data science in a lecture entitled, in praise of small data. Please welcome Nancy Reed. Thank you, Jill. Thank you very much, Jill. That's a lovely introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I, I'm particularly honored to notice that uh, one of the very few women speakers to give the Josiah Gibbs lecture was Ingrid Dobashis, who spoke earlier today in the first of three lectures. I'm going to say a few words about Gibbs because I had to look him up. Uh, and uh, I only knew about the Gibbs sampler, so I'll tell you just a little bit about that. Uh, as you may well know, but I wasn't too sure, the Gibbs distribution is a probability distribution or a measure for a complex system. It's also called the Boltzmann distribution, and it's probably called many other things as well. And I mentioned Stigler there because Steven Stigler is a famous statistician and Stigler's law of eponymy is that everything is named after the person who didn't invent it. Uh, the, the probability distribution has a density function that's quite simple. It's just an exponential of another function, but of course everything resides in, in the insides the function E is the energy and X is the state. So this gives the probability of being in any particular state. And beta is usually called the temperature or the inverse temperature. And the Z and the, the Z in the bottom is the partition function, which is just the thing that makes that F of X integrate to one because it's a probability density function. Or if it's on a discrete space, it would need to sum to one. The problem is the spaces are very, typically very, very big, and that's quite a difficult thing to compute. Uh, it's very useful in many, many different applied fields, like most mathematical ideas. It can be used in statistical physics, quantum mechanics, probability. It's used in statistical modeling, where we introduce parameters, and I would call it in that setting an exponential family model. And it's also very widely used in machine learning for neural networks and other complex structures. The Gibbs sampler came from a, a paper by Giemann and Giemann in 1984, and the title was 
Gibbs distributions and the Bayesian restoration of images. Ingrid talked a lot earlier today about uh, using wavelets to make images, to resolve images with a few measurements. Uh, the, these, this paper is about the restoration of noisy images using probabilistic methods. And in this paper, they introduced a stochastic model, essentially the Gibbs distribution, and a new algorithm. And the new algorithm was a sampling method that they called the Gibbs sampler. And I asked Stu Geeman how they came up with the name the Gibbs sampler, and he said, well, we had a box of Whitman's chocolates in a Whitman sampler, and we were trying to figure out what to call it, and Don said, let's call it the Gibbs sampler. <laughs> so that's the origin of the name, and you can see that names are kind of important in the way that something catches or doesn't catch. I'll come back to that a, a little bit later in a different context. Stuart described it as the perfect metaphor for what they were trying to do. Now this Gibbs sampler is one of a wide range of similar algorithms under the name Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And from about 1990 forward, these absolutely revolutionized statistical inference, replacing very difficult integrals with finite sums over computer-generated points. And it led in particular to an explosion of applications of Bayesian inference in complex problems. And it also led to a wealth of interesting new mathematical, statistical, and probabilistic questions, which in turn lead to new applications. And it really, I, I think, must be said that it led to a new generation of computational approaches to statistical science. And that's Josiah Gibbs. That's all I'm going to talk about in terms of Gibbs sampling, and that's almost all the math you'll see tonight. It's a late lecture, and we should take it easy on ourselves, so we'll be fresh for tomorrow. Um, so what's new in statistics? Well, you will have noticed if you're in an academic department of mathematics and statistics or in a university with two departments, that statistics enrollments are growing rather quickly and nowhere faster, I think, than at the University of Toronto, where we've gone from 400 program majors to 4,000 program majors in about 10 years. But we're not the only one. Uh, Harvard's gone from 20 to 200, so also a tenfold increase. And as I was preparing this lecture, our, our newsletter came out from the American Statistical Association with a, a head, headline that the statistics bachelor's degrees, that's the blue curve that you see here, have nearly quintupled in the last 10 years. So we're all find, finding an extremely increased pressure from larger and larger numbers of students wishing to take our programs. This is not what we were accustomed to. We were accustomed to having a lot of what my former dean used to call bums in seats. <laughs> a lot of big classes of people who had to take one stats course before they could graduate. But these are statistics majors. These are students who are planning to, to learn statistics and data, data science to a fairly high level. Um, the effect it's had, or the impact it's had, in, in addition to making statisticians rather happy, um, is that we're looking uh, much more outwards. Certainly at my own department, we, we're, we've been given quite a few new faculty lines to accommodate these students, and many, many, many of them are joint with other departments, and even the ones that aren't joint with other departments are kind of cross-disciplinary type appointments. So I would say we've gone from my training 40 years ago, which was rather theoretical and somewhat inward-looking, to being much more outward-looking. What caused all this? I started to notice it uh, around about 10 years ago. This is an article that every statistician pinned to their bulletin board at the time uh, for today's graduate, just one word, statistics. This was on the front page of the New York Times. And it, it surprised me to realize that only 10 years ago, at least I was cutting things out of a paper newspaper <laughs> and keeping them, <laughs> uh, which you don't see anymore. Um, but we all kept this one because it was just before this exponential curve started, but we had a feeling something was in the air. 
Um, now, the something that was in the air for a while was called Big Data. This, is the, this was a thematic program that the Fields Institute hosted uh, in uh, winter 2015. So that's about five years ago we were starting. Um, and that ran for six months with workshops also across the country and but the bulk of the activity at the Fields Institute. Um, by 2018, when we had our recapitulation workshop for the thematic program, big data was kind of out of fashion, so we renamed it data science, and that's kind of what people are talking about now. Um, and I, I just put these, the two full-length posters up. The details are too small to read, but I just wanted to emphasize that you can't run a program in big data or data science without the involvement of quite a wide range of people that work hard to get these things off the ground and their names are all listed here. Uh, so now, fast forward, data science workshop was 2018, now we're in 2020 and there's data science everywhere you look. This is just a handful of things that I found from Google. I put the Alan Turing Institute near the top because they were very quick off the mark to invest a lot of money in data science. Um, the Harvard Data Science Review, I wanted to mention, it's also on the next slide, but there's degree programs you can see at various places. There are data analytics boot camps here in Denver. Uh, I think they're running now. Um, the, my favorite one is the, this one, learn data science in your browser. <laughs> can you imagine if someone said learn physics in your browser? <laughs> They're not quite as similar as the established disciplines yet. It's not quite there. It's, um, it's definitely a job. It's definitely an area where students want to learn things. I don't know if it's a research area yet, uh, but it's getting there. Uh, there's a very, very nice overview in the current issue of the Harvard Data Science Review by Xiaoli Meng, the editor-in-chief, on his view of data science which he calls microscopic, telescopic, and kaleidoscopic. Um, but I think it's a, it's a rather thoughtful kind of overview of what this discipline might be. But I'm gonna talk mostly tonight about statistics and data science, as I promised, and, and where the overlap is. So I'm gonna start with a kind of, when people say, well, what, what do statisticians do, or what, what is statistics about if you only had one slide? I turned to one of my favorite books by Cox and Donnelly called Principles of Applied Statistics. And it's set out in, a, in this way that you start with a, in, in theory, you start with a scientific question. You think how data might shed some light on this and then you plan to collect such data. And in that planning you have to consider all the sources of variation and how you might minimize their impact with careful planning. So that's kind of step one of the applied statistics uh, process. Then we need to develop strategies for analyzing the data that we get, and that involves modeling, mathematical modeling, computation, and new methods of analysis, or careful and clever use of old methods of analysis. But in addition to that, we want to know that our methods of analysis are sensible, so there's a whole s strand of statistical research that tries to assess the properties of these methods, and that's what I've done throughout most of my career. And then for the particular scientific question, we need to know what impact these properties have on our problem. Somewhat newer in, a sen in the sense that it hasn't been emphasized in statistics programs is communicating the results, uh, both accurately but not too pessimistically, often using visualization strategies. But very important for statisticians conveying the uncertainties. And I emphasize the not pessimistically because statisticians do get a bit of a reputation for being, oh, you can't say that, and it didn't mean that, and you can't do this. And when we're working in an interdisciplinary world where the scientists are extremely enthusiastic about new insights, we're kind of the downers in the room. <laughs> and I think it's important to be careful, but not to be overly pessimistic. Now, data science is just a little bit different. I, I'm gonna come back to many of these topics, 
But, uh, and maybe just before I leave this slide, I wanted to emphasize that this is where most of our statistics courses are, the strategies for analysis and assessing the properties of the methods. Some courses cover the planning, but actually scientists are very, very good at designing experiments. Communication, we've really been not so skilled at conveying, but we're working on it, I would say. In data science, you can't have a bullet list, you need to have a workflow. Uh, so I made up my own workflow, it's a rather dull one, uh, but I, I did it myself and I did it all in Beamer and it took like a day, so I'm gonna use it. <laughs> um, and there's a, kind of a new emphasis in data science on the acquisition and preservation that really is a, a, a different realm of activity from conventional statistical science. And then there's this, what you might call a statistical science bits, slightly reworded, making sure the data is trustable and usable, fit for purpose is a phrase that's sometimes used. There's the modeling and analysis part, and there's definitely a very strong and new emphasis on reproducibility. Although it's fair to say that statistical science has been discussing re reproducibility for some time, but not in a, in a more technical way that's not so easily conveyed to the layperson. And then there's new issues arising around security and privacy as data is collected about people more and more readily. There's concerns about circ secu security and privacy and the ethics and, and policy and social impact of using this data for one purpose or another. And those are all, I think, quite new and not part of, really part of statistical science as I would think of it but part of a broader data science that needs a lot of different disciplines to be successful. Oh, there's the workflows that you can find that are snazzier than mine, but I'm sticking with the dull one. Um, so just to expand on some of these a little bit more, some of the terms that you hear around making data trustable and usable are provenance, sampling, we don't really need all one million people if we can get away with a thousand people, that's how pollsters have been making their living for years and they're pretty good at it. Cleaning the data, uh, the, usually the data that you're given to analyze is not in a suitable form for analysis till something is done to fix it up. Digitizing images, digitizing sound and so on. All these things are uh, getting the data ready for analysis, I guess you would say. And size and speed and accessibility are all factors that need to be considered. I think for this aspect, we need people from information science, from computer science, and from statistics. In the modeling and analysis, where most of us live our lives, I guess, uh, there's quite a bit of discussion in the difference between interpretable and predictive methods. Rough, very roughly speaking, statisticians prefer interpretable methods, and machine learning focuses more on accurate predictions. That's a, a very rough analogy, but I think it, it, there's uh, some truth to it. it. It depends what you're doing. If you're trying to find another movie for you to watch on Netflix, um, it doesn't matter if the model that you're using to do that has any interpretation. But if you're trying to decide whether a lesion on a, a, a radio slide is cancerous or non-cancerous, then it's not, it's not enough to just have the computer say yes or no. You need to know why it's making that decision. In uh, reproducibility, there's new uh, emphasis on accessibility of data so that uh, data is available. There's lots of open data. Uh, emphasis in government uh, now and data should be available to anyone who wants to access it. That's how it can have impact. But we need to make it accessible in a way that's usable as well. So there needs to be quite a bit of work done in dissemination and visualization. Again, we need information sciences. This is, I think, a new part that could rightly be called data science. Some of the terms that go with security and privacy include disclosure limitation, anonymization, encryption, differential privacy, you will, would have heard about in this lecture, I think two years ago. Um, computer science developed differential privacy, disclosure limitation has been a preserve of statistics agencies since they started. 
And we need some social science and humanities to help us think about the ethics and the policy and the social impacts. So I think data science is bigger than statistical science, but younger, so still finding its feet in, in terms of going between a job, a course, a program, and a, a research field. And in all of these, we need mathematics, statistics, computer science, and then I've emphasized in particular domain expertise because the, these problems live to be used. Uh, it's, it's not a self-referential system, it's an outward-looking system. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time on just two examples of statistics that kind of crosses over into data science. Uh, the first example is going to be about wildfires. And in particular, I'm going to look at a headline that was in our Globe and Mail at the beginning, well, one year ago uh, now, January 2019. Globe, the Globe and Mail is published in Toronto, and it's a national, new, it calls itself Canada's national newspaper, but everyone outside of Toronto calls it Toronto's national newspaper <laughs> because people in Toronto don't notice, but when you're not in Toronto, people in Toronto think everything is happening there. Uh, this headline was, uh, BC wildfires stoked by climate change likely to become worse. Study, whenever I see study in a headline, then I want to go and look up the study, so I did. And the study was a paper in, in a journal called Earth's Future. And the authors are Canadian. They're from the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium and the Canadian Center for Climate Modeling and Analysis. And the title of their paper was Attribution of the influence of human-induced climate change on an extreme fire season. So what does that mean? So uh, you might think, well, as, of course it's obvious. The world's getting hotter, so we're going to have bigger fires. The world's getting hotter, so we're going to have you know, more floods. We're going to have this, we're going to have that. I mean, everyone says that, and it's kind of true, I guess. But really, how can you attribute exactly the fire in British Columbia in 2017 to climate change. Well, that's a whole field of study called event attribution. And the National Academy of Sciences published uh, in, I think, 2016, but maybe 2015, a book uh, on the attribution of extreme weather events in the context of climate change. And they refer to the relatively young science of extreme event attribution. Seeks to tease out the influence of human-caused climate change from other factors such as natural sources of variability. There are naturally hotter and drier summers and colder and wetter ones, and so we're trying to separate out the different sources. So in this paper, the, um, they used a large ensemble of CAN RCM4, what's that? Well, that's a regional climate model for Canada, CAN Canada RCM4, it's the fourth version. And what it does is it takes a global climate simulation that Canada has run, and it downscales it to British Columbia, so that's the regional part. And it gives them a simulation of the climate in British Columbia for any period of time that they run the model for. So they simulate the global climate, that's a combination of a lot of physics and hydrology and so on, and mathematics, numerical analysis. And then they downscale that to British Columbia. And they used two time periods, 1961 to 70, and 2011 to 2020. And they had 50 runs of each climate simulation. So this is all fake data, this is what I'm trying to say. Um, now that fake data was also match to what little observational data there was, and interpolate it using thin plate splines, which is uh, from applied mathematics. Um, and they created several other measures, fire weather indices, precipitation, fire locations, mean air temperature. Th these are all the different data sources that were referenced in the paper. You can see that they gathered in everything they could find that was relevant. What did they conclude? They concluded that humans increased the area burned by a factor of 7 to 11. 
The seven to 11 warms the statistician's heart. They didn't say nine. They said seven to 11. That's a confidence interval that they worked out. They found several other uh, measures that could be attributed to climate change. The era, percent of the area burned, the likelihood of an extreme warm temperature, the likelihood of an extreme fire weather in the index. I'm just gonna focus on the first one and, and show you how they did it. They simulated the temperature series, as I said, 50 times. They related temperature to fire weather indices. That means an index that tells you how bad the fire season is this year. They used a model, a statistical model, to relate the fire weather index to the area burned. Higher index, but worse fire season, bigger fires. And then they compared the air distribution of the area burned in two decades, all through models. A picture is worth a thousand words, as, as Ingrid said this afternoon. So all those wiggly gray lines, those are the 50 simulations. And they're simulations of the area burned. So they didn't simulate area burned, they simulated temperature, and then they did a lot of steps to relate that to area burned. And that's what we have, we have 50 different time series of the area burned. They highlighted the little bit from 61 to 70 and the little bit from 20, 2010 to 2020. These are models, so they have all the years. And they made a kernel density estimate here, that's the blue curve, and another one over here, that's the red curve. There's the fire from 2017, it was big, and it's way out in the tail of the blue curve, but it's right in the middle of, well, not very far in the tail of the red curve. That's the seven to 11. Well, the seven to 11 is the little gray wiggles around it. The nine is the one right in the middle. You see, it would be very unlikely to get such a big fire in the decade 61 to 70, but it's not very unlikely now. And what changed? Well, we, we did, we heated up the planet. So that, that's the basis on which these decisions are made, or these conclusions are made. Okay, well, that was then. Now Australia is burning, and all the news said that it was because of climate change. The more measured uh, news item was from the BBC, which asked the question. Most other news sources said, gave the answer. But in this article, the, the experts are quoted as saying, the science around climate change is complex. It's not the cause of bushfires, but it is the cause of making the bushfires more often, more frequent, and more intense, which is what we're seeing. And the chief executive of bushfires in Australia said, we find it very difficult in general to attribute climate change impacts to a specific event, particularly while the event is running. So I think that we have to wait a little bit. We, we need to do some more modeling and more study of the, all the impacts on climate for the Australian fire season. And then we can look at an event attribution type analysis. But just when I got this all prepared and thought, okay, and on to the next example, this came out. Uh, a new paper in Nature that was reported in the Washington Post that says for the first time, scientists have detected the fingerprint of human-induced climate change on daily weather patterns at the global scale. And it goes on to say, if verified by subsequent work, the findings would upend the long-established narrative. This long-established narrative is weather is weather, it's what you get, climate is what happens over the long term, and you can't say that because it's hot today, that's climate change, that's the, the established narrative. And in fact, um, well, I, I've emphasized here the new study uses statistical techniques and climate model simulations because that suits my narrative. But the part I left out was they said that they claimed that the authors started this study because of Donald Trump tweeting on a very cold day in the winter that climate change must be bunk because it's so cold out today. And they thought, well, let's look at this a little bit more carefully. So this is, I think, the first of, of some analyses that may, we may be able to see now in weather events, the, the fingerprint of climate change. But it's very tentative still, I would say. 
Okay, so that's a hard science or a physical science example. My next example is a social sciences example. And I, I found it on, like I find many of my examples on Twitter. Uh, this was tweeted by the New York Times and it said, want to live longer, try going to the opera. There you go. Researchers in Britain have found that people who reported going to a museum or concert even once a year lived longer than those who didn't. I thought, I'm going to have so much fun with this. <laughs> this is perfect. In fact, I found it not on the New York Times web tweet, but I, I, find, I follow Colleen Bullshit, uh, who tweeted, want to live longer, try driving a BMW. <laughs> And I just want to point out, there's a talk tomorrow evening by Carrie Diaz-Eaton, who teaches a course called Calling Bull with R. It's based on the course given at the University of Washington called Calling Bullshit. And I mentioned uh, the importance of naming. Um, someone tweeted, where are our students learning the kind of thing that they would learn in this Calling Bullshit course? This looks great. And I looked up the course as soon as it was announced. It got a lot of press. And I thought, wait a minute, I've been teaching that for years. But I called it Statistics in the News. <laughs> well, that was a boring name. <laughs> so you see, naming can be quite important. <laughs> OK, the tw uh, Twitter Fest had a, a blast with this. In other news, people who eat brunches in absurdly priced museum cafeterias live longer. Uh, rich people live longer. Who knew? Seriously, you get paid for this? Oh my god. But the, my favorite was the joke that I found on a website. Did you see that going to the opera makes you live longer? No, it just makes it feel longer. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd thought that up, but that's my friend Tom Lumley, who has a great blog called Stats Chat that I can highly recommend. OK, so let's have fun. So I looked at the New York Times article first, and then they claim that there's evidence that simply being exposed to the arts may help people live longer. Researchers in London felt, followed thousands of people. The study controlled for socioeconomic factors like income, educational level, and mobility. OK, well, that's sounding fairly serious. They collected data from 6,700 people. That's not a small sample who responded to questionnaires. This uh, got me worried. The researchers combed through the data they had collected to search for patterns. That should send your calling bullshit detector going or your alarm bells ringing. Um, combing through the data to search for patterns doesn't mean that you've proved anything, of course. Well, it's not fair to just rely on the New York Times. The article was published in the British Medical Journal. It was called The Art of Life and Death, 14-Year Follow-Up Analysis of Associations. And this is the first page. It's by Daisy Fancourt and Andrew Steptoe from University College London. And they mention the English longitudinal study of aging. So more Google searches, that's a thing. It's a, a, an ongoing study in the UK of uh, in, insight into a maturing population. That's most many of us. Um, the baby boomers are being studied because we're going to have such an impact on the health system, I guess. And so and this English longitudinal study of aging is a very serious and ongoing effort with several waves and lots of papers published about it. And it was developed as a companion study to a similar one that's being carried out in the United States called the Health and Retirement Study. Everyone in the study was at least age 50 in 2002. And it's a nationally representative sample. And they have, as I mentioned, uh, just under 7,000 participants with complete information. And they found information on their mortality by linking their records to the National Health Service. I mentioned record linkage in small print here because that's a whole area of statistical study that's also very important in the big data era. How to link one database to another database. Computer scientists do it one way, statisticians do it a different way, and there's many, many hybrids that are being developed. And this was the, the raw data, if you like. This is what they found. If you never were involved in what they called receptive arts engagement, that means not making art, but receiving art, going to the museum, going to the opera, 
then the percentage of people who were, never went, who died in the 14 years, was about 48%, whereas those who went frequently, it was only about 18%, and in between was about 26. So the headline is, you know, it, the, the rate went down from 47% to 26 to 18. Okay, that's not, as, as you could quickly see from the Twitter, or just thinking about it for a minute, that's not good enough because healthy people live longer and healthy people are healthy enough to go to the opera, so we need to break it down. This is the broken down part, and the gap is not nearly so great. Instead of going down by 47 to 26 to 18, so you're going down almost under a half, this has you going down about 30% and 14% in the first drop. So it's late at night to do all these percentages, but from 47 to 26 is, so I don't know, not quite half, and from 26 to 18 is about another third, I guess. But it's, it's not that much. It's uh, uh, about 14% and then another, whatever that makes up 31, 17%. Um, now this is based on a model. You can see that it's based on a model because there's a whole lot of people that live to 105, uh, and that's pretty old. And they're, they're probably not of, of 7,000 people in Britain, there can't be that many that live to 105. But the point is, in these uh, survival curves, the blue curve is low. That means people are dropping off quickly. Those are the people who didn't ever engage in arts, receptive arts engagement, and the highest curve are the people who did it frequently. And they adjusted for a large number of confounding factors, as you would expect they would. Uh, education, wealth, uh, pre-existing diseases, uh, mobility and disability, uh, depression, cognition, and so on. They, so this is all a regression modeling exercise. And when they adjusted for all the confounders for which they had measurements, they found that there was still only about 42% of that difference was explained, so there's still a difference to be explained. And that's the difference they're attributing to the arts. Uh, although, very cautiously, all these details, of course, are in the supplementary analysis, which gives all the stuff that you would, might teach in an applied statistics course that gets you right down to the details. For tonight, it's just enough to know that the key analysis was based on a model, a regression model, a special kind of regression model that we call proportional hazards regression. The, uh, the model assumptions were checked using residuals, and the analysis was weighted to accommodate the data that was missing. And they did three sets of sensitivity analyses. They did subgroup analyses, they did a finer adjustment for confounders, and they did a lot of further testing of model assumptions, even testing what they called reverse causality, which is what, what, what the Twitter users thought of right away. Well, if, you're, if you feel well enough to go to the opera, then you're, you're more likely to live longer. There are some very cleverly designed biostatistical techniques that can tease this out, and they didn't find any evidence of that. They concluded that the results were broadly consistent with the related literature, and it's a dose-response effect, which is something that you hope to see. If, if something's good for you, then more of it is even better for you. That's, um, and their conclusion was that they suggested that receptive arts engagement could, and that's my emphasis, could have independent, longitudinal protective associations with longevity. They also mentioned they did not compare the relative effect of the size of the arts and with other known predictors, but other factors are undoubtedly have a larger bearing. So of course, like you don't go to the arts to live longer, it's better to be rich. <laughs> um, so there, other factors have a bigger effect on mortality, but they still did find a differential effect after accounting for those other factors. And they concluded a causal relation cannot be assumed because unmeasured confounding factors still could be responsible. They didn't measure everything under the sun. Um, or to say it more simply, a correlation doesn't imply causation, but it doesn't sell newspapers either. So the New York Times was a little more freewheeling than the authors were. 
Uh, as I mentioned, and I got this also from my favorite blog, if you're going to a concert primarily for the health effects, well, probably not. You could probably, there's other things you could do for your health. But I, I do think this was actually quite a strong and good study, and I'll give the last word to the author, uh, who tweeted, today my paper is published in BMJ, showing arts engagement is associated with, very careful, longevity in older adults. Confounders, obviously a big challenge, but results consistent in well-adjusted models and multiple sensitivity analyses. And I think, uh, although I was kind of uh, rubbing my hands with glee, thinking that I would have a, an example to show you of some really bad statistics, I think actually this is really, really good statistics, which is better in the end. <laughs> um, so I wanted to come back a little bit. Those are, those are the two examples I've done of several, and I, I have lots of bad ones, but I only have 50 minutes. Um, and the bad ones are fun. I could entertain you after the talk with <laughs> several sub-slides, but um, I wanted to come back to two aspects of a statistical and mathematical center of data science that are, I think, getting more emphasis now than they have in the past and need, need more emphasis. One is re reproducibility, and the other is uh, dissemination and visualization. And I won't say very much about these, uh, but I will have a few comments. Um, and reproducibility, there are some really good statistical analyses, and they're paired with really good science or good social science, as I, I, think, I hope I've convinced you with these two examples. There are some really bad ones, too. And um, it's, it's not always obvious from the headline whether it's going to be good or bad. This particular headline is one I, I didn't prepare for tonight, but it said claims about a treatment for Alzheimer's should be met with caution. More trials would be a good idea. Uh, this was based on a, a trial of about 15 or 20 patients over a relatively short period of time, and they didn't find anything, but they kept going and for another shorter period, short period of time with a few more patients, and they got P less than 0.05. And then, then they started saying, well, maybe there's something here. And that's the pesky P value that I was describing earlier, that um, beloved of psychology uh, papers or hated by psychology papers, depending who you talk to, uh, blamed um, on on statisticians and particularly on Fisher, uh, one of our, 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 our Josiah Gibbs, <laughs> is a Ronald Fisher. Um, uh, but the, it's the, well, it's a search for shortcuts, I say, I would say. Reproducibility of science is harmed by the rote use of any tool, really. Um, if, if you don't think about what you're doing, then you, you can make, you, mistakes, you have to have a sanity check. But p-values are unfortunately one of those tools that are misunderstood and misused. Um, here's another uh, study that I, I would love to talk about in detail. Can in intermittent fasting reset your immune system? So th this, was, this was the headline. The article was a review paper and the, it, it appeared in, our, in a lot of newspapers on the, in the, sorry, the sports section. You may know people that try to lose weight by, say, fasting for, um, from dinner to lunch the next day. My neighbor was telling me about this in the summer. Um, and there's a there's cer certain amount of evidence that fasting increases longevity in mice, hashtag in mice, watch for that one. But there, and there, the fasting that's usually looked at is something like five days on and two days off, or several days of fasting followed by a low calorie diet, or there's all these different things. Okay, they're all almost impossible for any of us to do, but it might not be impossible to go to bed after dinner and not eat until lunchtime, right? And if that was just as good, well, okay, let's try it. But this study was really it was a meta-analysis of many studies, most of them in animals, very few of them in people, and only one of them in people that were followed for more than about three weeks, and most of them didn't stick to the diet. So P was less than 0.05 in one of those studies, but 
yeah, that's the flag, I think. Let your alarm bells ring when you hear the effect was small but statistically significant. It's probably more complicated than that. Most, most science is. Uh, this is another one that has a, a, very, uh, a, a very misleading headline, quitting Facebook could change your life. Uh, of course, the article was much more cir circumspect, but the article was measuring people's feelings of well-being after they gave up Facebook for two weeks, I think it was. Um, but in fact, the article was written by economists, and what they were really interested in was how much money would they have to pay you to give up Facebook for two weeks, and they found they had to give you $102. <laughs> and, and it was much more about the economic impact, and it was very little about the effect on your life. So those are some of the, uh, the ones that have been in the headlines recently. Uh, visualization, so I mentioned that because, of course, I, I, there's lots of data out there, but it's awfully hard to look at. So mostly what we see are the pictures, and the pictures are dimension reducing. Obviously, they're, they're reducing something very complicated to one or two dimensions, or maybe three. Um, so there's good ways and bad ways to do that. Again, coming back to the Australia fires, um, misleading maps and pictures go viral. And this was a map that was incorrectly attributed to NASA, to a view from space of the Australia fires. But in fact, it's an artist's rendering of the view from space of the fires evolving over time. So all that bright glow is aggregated fire over several days. So if the fires went out, the glow didn't go down, it only got brighter. So it's actually quite misleading. And again, I'm indebted to, once more to Thomas Lumley. This is the map that was made by the Guardian's uh, illustration department, uh, Nick Evershed in particular, the Guardian of Australia, which shows more accurately, in some sense, where the fires are. It's much less dramatic, of course, than this. And, um, but it, it's, it's somehow more uh, visually more honest. Now, maps are never honest, as we know. The, the areas, uh, we're mapping a globe to a flat plane, so it's, they can't be completely honest, but this one is somewhat more honest. Why did I call my talk in praise of small data? Um, well, I would say as a benchmark, no matter how much data you have, you don't have as much as you thought you did. Why, why is that? Well, problems are complicated, and we're looking for the things we're interested in often involve people, and we just don't have that much data on all those people. So for the, the wildfires example with climate change that I mentioned, there were 50 climate simulations times 10 years, so that's 500 observations that went into each of those curves. That's not very many at all, but those 50 climate simulations take a long time to run. Um, how good are those climate simulations? All this attribution is based on the simulation. How good are the models? There's another very interesting recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences by two climate scientists worried that the climate modelers are not being very open about how much their models disagree with each other because they're worried that that'll be taken as a sign that they don't know that the climate's actually changing. And they do know that climate's actually changing, but the models can't really do the fine scale work yet. And they certainly, the, the downscaling, for example, to um, the New South Wales or lower um, British Columbia is really tricky and probably not that accurate yet. Um, the museum item that I mentioned, well, that's the 6,700 6, people that had complete information. That's a huge sample. Those people have to be tracked and linked, and they all had to fill out a detailed questionnaire. That takes a long time and a lot of money. You're not going to get a lot more than that. Um, well, you'll hear people say, oh, we've got a billion observations. Like Google has a billion observations on everything. But Often they're looking for very, very, very rare events, like the Higgs boson. Yes, they have terabytes of data they're collecting every minute or, or something, but 
really what they're looking for is, is not a needle in a haystack, but like a micro needle in a, in a haystack the size of the solar system. So there's, all of a sudden you don't have that many observations. If you look at the pictures when the Higgs boson was announced, there's not that much data in those pictures. It's amazing. Um, we have a thousand observations in every county on every day, but those aren't independent observations. There's correlation over time, and there's correlation over space. So if you're perfectly correlated to your neighbor, then there's no point in measuring both of you. There's no new information added by asking your neighbor if they're gonna give the same answers that you gave. So correlations can really deteriorate and make the sample size much smaller than it appears on first glance. And the thing that I would give another talk about on another day is when you, when you have lots of data, then of course you wanna do more complicated modeling. You wanna look for, you wanna fit more higher dimensions or you wanna look for more complex dependence models with more parameters or you wanna look at like streams. All, all these examples are like that. So there's a lot of work in statistical, theoretical uh, statistical work ongoing now and, and it's a very exciting area to be working in. But there's not gonna be a lot of data for that because we're always gonna look further and further for the more rare events. Quality is much more important than quantity, much, much more important. You can, you can have millions and millions of observations. The, lit, the Literary Digest poll of 1936 interviewed, I don't know, 100 million Americans and they got it wrong because they only interviewed Republicans. So <laughs> it's, uh, um, it's, it's easy to have a lot of bad data. Quality is much more important than quantity. In, in another talk I gave, I said, it's not, big, it's not about big data, it's about smart data. And then I, I was kind of embarrassed because I was quoted about that. Nancy Reed says it's not big data, it's smart data. But I didn't actually say it. I got it from the Gartner hype cycle where they changed their category of big data to smart data at some point. But it's, it's like in life, quality is more important than quantity. It's late in the evening. I'll leave you with one of the worst visualizations I came across in preparing for this talk, because you might be hungry and you might be going out for pizza. This is a pie chart that makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> and I see one of these probably uh, every year. <laughs> uh, they're quite popular. Um, and I'll say thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for that terrific lecture. We do have time for a few questions. If you have questions, please go to one, uh, one of the mics there. Um, there's, there should be several of them. Sorry, it's hard to see, but I'll... Well, I wish we could there's have another. Oh, we see some, okay, thank you. Yep, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, I'll plug my talk at 3.15 tomorrow, I'll be talking about big data and data science and statistics and why statistics need to change. But how do we get our departments to value our research that we're doing in data science when a lot of times they feel that theoretical um, mathematics and statistics is more important than, say, working with real data. Yeah, it's, it's hard, I, I agree. Um, and it's, uh, every department is different and every university is different. It, it, there does tend to be, especially in, in uh, mathematics and statistics departments, um, uh, people's hearts are in the theory often. Uh, I have to say as a statistician, my heart is often in the theory and I'm sometimes a bit embarrassed to give talks where there's no theory because I think, well, it's not serious. But I'm, I'm weaning myself off that because it's so important for society and science, right? And it's, it's become so obvious. And I think that's why statisticians are kind of excited to see their field growing. That it's, We knew it was important, but now it, it's so obviously important in so many different dimensions that you just have to keep saying it. If your colleagues don't agree, show them the student numbers. The students know that this is important. And that's where they want to be. Um, but I, I appreciate it can be an uphill battle. And 
uh, academic departments are slow to change, as uh, I guess we all know, but uh, they're changing. Any other questions? Other questions? All right, well, let's, uh, let's thank Nancy Reed once again for a great talk. <laughs>